So uh, thanks, Jennifer, and uh, hi, everyone. Uh, good morning and uh, good evening, uh, depending on where you are. Uh, it's great to virtually see all of you, and all of us can be together in person, but it is what it is these days. I hope you have enjoyed this setup as well. Uh, it's a challenge to organize a global event in China uh, because we have to satisfy both an English and Chinese audience we are currently live streaming the conference in both hopping platform for global audience and as well as in Bilibili, uh, one of the largest video sharing website in China uh, for Chinese audience. Uh, big thanks to Jennifer, Dianjin and everyone for putting a lot of time and effort into making this a great experience. Uh, so my name is CJ Guo. Uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Stream Native. Stream Native is the company behind Pulsar, offering Pulsar as a service. And I'm also the PMC member of Pulsar and Bookkeeper. Uh, I have been with these two projects for a long time. I'm here today to share a couple of my thoughts around Pulsar and the convergence of messaging, streaming, and storage behind the adoption train. Uh, but before kind of diving into the main topic, uh, I would like to use a couple of minutes to talk about Pulsar adoption in the community in Asia. So uh, Pulsar has had a strong adoption in Asia since the launch of the project. As you may have known that, there are a lot of top tier companies in Asia use Pulsar heavily in production. For example, uh, Yahoo Japan, Tencent, and many others. I'd like to walk you through a couple of important milestones of Pulsar community in Asia. So uh, let me get started by pulling out the image that Jennifer shared before. Uh, it is the figure of the growth of uh, Pulsar GitHub star. As you all can see from this diagram, uh, Jai and me kind of started the first uh, Pulsar meetup in Beijing around late September, 2018. We celebrate Pulsar graduating as a top level project. In that meetup, there were about 200 signups and about 150 people attend that meetup. After the first very successful meetup, we run Pulsar meetups every two to three months in China, from Beijing, Shanghai, Hangzhou to Shenzhen. So uh, then we reach kind of to the second uh, milestone. And uh, this is just a kind of photo from our first uh, like Pulsar meetup in Beijing. And there's what, there were about like one, 150 people there. And the second milestone is in August 2019. After running the community in China for about 10 months, we have grown the number of the postal adopters from almost zero uh, to dozens in China. We organized the first ever one-day one event in Beijing. And at that time, uh, we still call it Postal Beijing Meetup, uh, but it should have been called Postal Asia Meetup because Nozomi and his team uh, kind of flew uh, from Yahoo Japan, flew from Japan to Beijing to attend this meetup. Nozomi also shared Yahoo Japan's adoption story to the broader postal community in China. We have uh, about a couple of hundreds of people attending that meetup. And it was kind of a great event. And there was a, another photo from uh, postal uh, Asia meetup. And now, we kind of reach into a new milestone. We, we are all here to celebrate the first ever Pulsar Summit Asia. So uh, Asia has plan, uh, played a very important role in the growth of Pulsar project and its community. We have grown the number of the contributors from almost 10, uh, around like 30 people to close to 330 people. In these 10 times growth, close to 50% uh, of a contribution are from Asia. So looking back to Pulsar's adoption story in Asia, uh, it started uh, with Yahoo Japan. Uh, Yahoo Japan adopted Pulsar in the early days, even before Pulsar was donated to uh, Apache Software Foundation. Now Yahoo Japan has been using Pulsar for almost four years. It's using Pulsar as a messaging backbone to process uh, hundreds of billions of messages every day. And Zhao Ping, another early adopter, it 
it it is a leading online recruitment platform in, based in China. It started it started its journey around July two thousand eighteen. At the time, it, uh, I was still in my previous company, Streamlio. Uh, Peng Hui, who was the tech lead um, messaging platform in Jiaoping, and he reached out to the uh, Apache Bookkeeper community. Initially, they look into building uh, a new messaging platform based on Apache Bookkeeper to solve the problems they face in RedBMQ. But after a couple of uh, conversations, I convinced them to use Posa instead of building their own messaging platform on Bookkeeper. Because if you have been in Bookkeeper community for a long time, you might already notice that uh, a lot of people and a lot of team, even a lot of companies try to build different messaging systems on top on top of Bookkeeper. So uh, I eventually con convinced Peng Hui and Peng Hui, Jia and me, three of us are kind of from different companies and from different time zones. And uh, Peng Hui and Jia were in Beijing and I was in San Francisco. We, we literally in different uh, kind of different side of the world. And we were work together on putting Pulsar into Jiaoping's uh, production. And it, it's a success, it was a, a very successful uh, action and it shows the power of open source community collaborations. And that was kind of the, uh, what we have been put a lot of efforts in the open source community and uh, work with different partners on driving uh, the Pulsar adoption in, uh, in the usage in different uh, industry and for different use cases. So uh, Jiaoping went to production on September 2018, around the time Pulsar are graduating as a top level project. After going to production, uh, the adoption kind of went crazy and they, uh, they support 1 billion messages per day in a month after Pulsar went on production. They tripled the traffic uh, at the end of 2018. In they, eventually increased to uh, 20, 20 times the traffic after a year running Pulsar. Now they are using Pulsar for processing hundreds of billions of messages every day. And the Jiaoping team is also presenting their story this, this afternoon. Uh, if you're interested in hearing more about their story, definitely don't miss their talk. And so looking back in the whole uh, adoption story, adoption history in Asia in early 2019, we literally have only two companies adopting Pulsar, Yahoo Japan and Jiaoping. Now that in the last nine two years, Pulsar has been adopted by hundreds of companies in Asia. And as you can see, there are a lot of top tier companies in this list, like Tencent, VIP Kid, China Telecom, China Mobile, Beagle, Yam China, Zhuhu, Tuya Smart, Huawei, and many others. And these companies are also from different industries, uh, from internet, e coms retail, uh, finance to IoT. Some of the, the companies are also presenting uh, at this summit, definitely don't miss their talks. Among all these use cases, I would like to highlight a number. 10 billion. So this is the total number of the financial transactions processed by ten, Tencent bidding platform every day. And it's powered by uh, Apache Pulsar. Pulsar has been proven to uh, be able to support internet scale mission critical workload. And in other words, I usually would say it has been proven to support Chinese internet scale mission critical workload. So I hope in Pulsar Summit Asia next year, and I can see thousands of company, not just hundreds of companies presenting uh, in the conference about how they adopt Pulsar, and we can hear more and more like, uh, like Pulsar user stories. So, and we all see the rise of Pulsar. And before I kind of uh, dive into uh, uh, the main topic, let me, I uh, apologize, I need to double check if my audio and the other stuff is fine. Oh no, I, if it seems I'm fine, okay. So uh, actually, let me just double, okay. 
So uh, kind of back into the main, main topic, uh, we all see the rise of Pulsar, but why? So uh, when something new is happening, uh, there's a reductive view of a thing and there's an expensive view. So the reduct reductive view is, well, there's nothing much change. And the expensive view is, what well, if this is true in the large and what would be new in different? So the reductive, reductive view of Pulsar is, it is just another messaging queue. It is just another data pipeline. We have so many master queues in the past. Now it's a more scalable queue and it can solve bigger problems but there's nothing really fundamentally different. Obviously that's wrong. And I take a much more expensive view on this space and I will try to explain what's happening. I think there's a fundamental change in what we think in the world of messaging, streaming, data management and data infrastructure. Let me explain my thought. So, I see there were kind of three trains in the real-time data infrastructure. The first train is the convergence of messaging. We talk a lot about queues in streams, but queues in streams are not separate. They are actually two sides of the same coin. And the second train is the convergence of batch in streaming. We have heard a lot in the industry um, talking about like unified batch in streaming in the computing world that the industry is really lacking a data storage system that is able to provide a unified presentation for both batch and event streaming data. And the last trend is the rise of public cloud in cloud native. Uh, we all need uh, a cloud native data system that is able to run and operate in a cloud native way. And let me explain, like, uh, explain them one by one and that can, hope that can answer why there's a rise of Pulsar. So let me get started uh, with the first train, converged messaging. So for people who might already heard about and use Pulsar before, you might already know that we have talked a lot about Pulsar's unified messaging model. For people who know Pulsar the first time, Pulsar provides a unified messaging model through different subscription types. In other words, you can just store one copy of data in Pulsar and have different ways to consume the data. And why there's a rise of converged mastering. So usually in the mastering world, there are two of the most common types of mastering that they're used uh, kind of in different uh, use cases in workloads. They are queues in streams. And queues are usually used in application mastering. They're used for enable asynchronous communication. They are often deployed on platforms such as uh, RedMQ, MQP, JMS, and among the others. Uh, in China, you probably already uh, also hear another popular, popular one is uh, LockMQ. And queues are like focus on single event messaging and require extremely uh, low latency. Uh, in the contrast, uh, stream are usually used in data pipelines. They're used to move high volume of data between different systems. They are often developed on platforms such as uh, Apache Kafka or AWS Kinesis. Streams focus on multiple events in multiple streams uh, matching and usually require high throughput. Uh, these two types of matching are usually performed on different systems and serve different functions and companies uh, usually need to operate both but usually they are not complete isolate. Uh, the data in the queues in streams are usually just two sides of the data. The only difference is how you want to consume the data or the way how you consume the data. So, so company really need to operate both systems to achieve their business goals. However, developing and managing separate systems is not only expensive and complicated, but can also make it difficult to integrate systems in centralized data. I have worked uh, with a lot of companies in Pulsar community, and I also have heard a lot of them not only operating one messaging system, but they usually operate multiple messaging systems. 
from traditional master queues like WebMQ, uh, APMQ, LockMQ to event streaming systems like Kafka. So let me just uh, use an example to explain like how complicated that uh, your system can become. So uh, assume you are kind of a business owner or you just start new business and yeah, your business usually gets started with uh, building uh, microservices and you're going to build uh, two microservices and you need asynchronous communication between uh, these two microservices. Then you need to introduce a uh, master queues. And in this diagram, uh, it's uh, RabMQ or it's ActMQ. And as your business grows, then uh, you're going to introduce IoT. You're touching IoT area and you're adding IoT devices into your business. Then you need to introduce another MQTT broker to collect all the IoT data from different uh, IoT devices and uh, feed the data into uh, different functions of your business. So your, then your business continue growing and uh, your business grow, grows into a larger, larger scale. Now you're going to build your own uh, data team and uh, you're going to introduce streaming uh, data technologies like either uh, a, a stream computing engine or any, any other analytical tools. So you bring Kafka into your organization and you have, then you need to run like a tools like Kafka Connect or uh, write your own uh, uh, customized applications to connect data uh, from WebMQ and MQTT broker to Kafka cluster for streaming analytics. The, the streaming analytics jobs need to also need to write the data back to your MQTT broker because the analytics job is usually for computing any actions that you need to take on uh, in the other side of your business, like your, your microservice or your like IoT applications. So, so the streaming analytics job need to write data back to your MQTT broker to trigger any actions on your IoT devices or notify your microservice using RabMQ. So then you see that you have to build uh, connections between your microservices, IoT uh, applications, uh, analytics jobs, and you need to draw a lot of connection between this system to the other system. And that usually leads into a, a gen mass. Because uh, as your business grows, you want to centralize your, all your data to maximize the real-time value out of it. But in reality, your data is segregated into different systems. And if you're using different matching system, it would become more and more expensive and complicated to operate. So you, what you really need is a converged matching solution. And POSA is such a, a converged matching solution. And POSA is a kind of a distributed matching and event streaming platform that is built uh, on top of a scalable stream uh, log storage. It gives user the ability to deploy it as a traditional queues so that you can use uh, in, uh, used in your microservice for asynchronous communication, or you can deploy POSA as a Kafka-like system that, uh, that can be used in data pipelines. So the converged uh, messaging capability uniquely uh, position POSA as an ideal platform to provide unified messaging uh, model. The unified messaging uh, model makes it e really easy for the organization to capture and distribute their data, which facilitate the use of real-time data to drive the business innovations. And not only POSA itself provide uh, uh, unified messaging model. Uh, in earlier this year, we introduced a pluggable protocol handler framework in POSA to allow developers uh, to be able to implement different messaging protocols, leveraging uh, POSA as a, a scalable stream and log storage. So on, on top of this framework, we build uh, a lot of uh, protocol handlers like Kafka and POSA. MQP on POSA and MQTT on POSA. So to support popular messaging protocols, 
that make it even easier for companies to leverage this unified messaging capability. You just need to store one copy of the data and consume it using the most suitable tools for a business requirement. And uh, according to uh, our user survey earlier this year, about 42% of the Pulsa users are using Pulsa to replace two or more messaging system. Like usually it's uh, RabbitMQ and Kafka. So building a converged messaging solution or building a unified messaging platform for enterprise is not just a slogan or a, a dream. It's actually happening among all the companies that who adopt Pulsar in the, in the, in the broader Pulsar community. So that is the first trend that we see behind the, the arising of Pulsar is the uh, converged messaging requirement drive the adoption of Pulsar. And the second trend is unified batch in stream. And if you're from China, or uh, you have been in Flink community for a long time, you probably have heard about the concept of uh, unified batch in streaming. In Mandarin, it's called uh, P Liu Yi Ti, Liu Pi Yi Ti. So recently, most of the data processing engines have been developed to do both batch and stream processing. And Apache Flink is one of the example. Currently, Flink is used for stream processing uh, with both Kafka in Pulsar. However, Flink's batch uh, capabilities are not particularly compatible with Kafka, as Kafka is on, only able to do uh, to deliver data in streams, making making it too slow for most of the batch workload. The need of a unified batch and event stream storage is arising. And why is that? Uh, I would like kind of uh, step back a bit and kind of talk about a, a fundamental challenge that a real-time data system is facing. Uh, the challenge is uh, to provide the capability to connect uh, your application to data stored in it. And we usually get started by solving the problem by using uh, classical databases. Uh, I have to say, uh, classical databases are the most successful data system of uh, the relational database is the most successful paradigm so far. They're used for kind of storing static data records and they provide point in time queries on static store records, or you can run periodical uh, batch processing job to process or query the record store in it. Uh, it's a very typical batch system, which is used for answering the question, what happened in the world? In contrast, messaging system uh, like queues or uh, streams are typically used in stream processing. They're used for storing and passing through the changes that are happening in the world. Uh, and they are used for un answering the question, what is happening in, in, the, in the world? So are these two different systems, obviously they are not. And tables and streams are just two sides of the same, same coin, coin. They actually rep represent the same copy of the data. The changes of a table usually becomes a stream a stream can be materialized into a table. And more and more, both of the system are actually used for answering one broader question. What is uh, contextually happening in the world? Why contextual is so important? Let me explain uh, using an industry as an example. Uh, a, uh, a very popular industry, fast food deliver. And most of us uh, should have been kind of very dominant with it. In, in US, you can use Uber Eats, DoorDash. In Southeast Asia, you can use Grab. In China, you can use uh, Meituan and many others. And if you, uh, assuming you, you are an a engineer and you want to start your own company, on your, on your own business, you're going to build a fast food deliver, delivery application. And the most common questions your application would answer for, for our customers would be, where's the food? And obviously you can answer the question by querying that location tracking event. And because 
like e now like everyone has a smartphone and you have the G gps locations but you you just uh, for answering this question you just need real time events and you don't need any other data and it's a very straightforward uh, real time uh, streaming applications but where's my food is obviously useful however it's not that useful because uh, as a customer i don't care where's my food i care about where can i get my food so in order to answer this question you can you cannot just use real time location tracking event you need to answer it using the real time location tracking event combined with historical data but why because it's an etf question it's not just a, a location question uh, in order to answer an ETA question, you need to combine a lot of driving factors like the traffic, the weather, and uh, a lot of kind of uh, decision factor that would impacting uh, your uh, ETA. So this type of uh, queries are actually contextual uh, real-time queries. You need both real-time location events combined with his data or his context. So this is just a very simple example to demonstrate the difference between real-time queries and contextual real-time queries. Because company today not only need to be able to make timely decisions and react to changes quickly, the need for real-time meaningful data has never been, been more critical, but at the same time, it's more and more crucial to be able to be uh, integrate and understand the large amount of historical data and combine real-time data in order to gain a complete picture of a, of a business. So the, the rising of uh, contextual event-driven business requirement drives the need of a real unified batch in event stream storage. And Pulsar is actually uh, such a storage system. Uh, the segment-centric design in tier storage model provides the batch storage capabilities that needed for supporting both uh, stream, uh, stream and batch processing in, in Flink. And now we have a very good integration with Flink uh, for its streaming capabilities. But in the near future, uh, Flink's batch processing capability will be fully integrated with Pulsar enabling companies to query both historical data and real-time data quickly and more easily. And it unlocks an unique advantage uh, of, for Pulsar and also for the business using Pulsar and Flink to do uh, both uh, batch and stream processing. So that is the second trend that I see behind the, uh, uh, the rise of Pulsar. Uh, it still was driven by the the demand of a unified batch in event stream storage. And that is the, that comes to the last trend. Uh, it's the rising of public cloud in cloud native computing. So the, the existen, existence of cloud native technology empowers the organization to build and run scalable application in modern uh, dynamic environments such as public, private, and hybrid clouds. And we have so many technologies in cloud native uh, computing ecosystem like containers, service, server, uh, service meshes, microservices, uh, immutable infrastructure, and a lot. But CNCF doesn't have a clear definition what is a cloud native uh, data system. So in, in my opinion, a cloud native uh, data system should include the following properties. Uh, first, it should be made uh, to be uh, run on, on Kubernetes very easily. And obviously that, that is true because Kubernetes is the uh, operating system for the whole cloud native ecosystem. And, and uh, from an open source project perspective, uh, Helm chart and operators should become the standard and should be supported officially by any uh, of the, these open source uh, cloud native uh, data system. And on top of Kubernetes, and you should be a scalable system and be able to leverage all the elasticity of cloud resources. Like you can get the CPU, memory, persist disk, and 
and and storage resources uh, as you as you can, and it should be serverless. And in the term of uh, serverless, I mean the user of the serv system don't need to care about the concept of uh, servers, and it should have a use usage as you go model. And the system should be provide multi tenancy by default, and be able to offer infinity storage capacity. And Besides that, you should also have a multi-cloud strategy, and the system should be able to be able to deploy on different cloud providers, and also be able to replicate data across different geo locations. And the system should be secure and reliable. Like almost by default, you should be able to provide TLS encryption for uh, wire transfer, and be able to encrypt data that is stored in the system and even provide the end-to-end -end encryption uh, capability. And the whole system should be, uh, uh, should have an API-driven design and be able to easily integrate with a modern CICD pipeline. So Pulsar was designed from ground up to be cloud-native. The most fundamental difference that Pulsar has is multi-layer cloud-native architecture which separate the computing and uh, serving layer from the storage layer. It provides high availability and be able to scale independent, independently. And it's more resilient to uh, failures in comparing to uh, mo uh, monolithic, uh, a monolithic uh, architecture, which was used in the system that one, one was not designed for cloud native operations. So, we have written a lot of articles about this architecture and I'm, I'm not going to duplicate the conversation here. However, I want to emphasize one important aspect that, you should, that is usually missed when people talking, uh, talk about the benefits of a cloud native multi-layer architecture. And that, that is uh, about uh, data tiering in IO isolation. And that is also the key to the success of a cloud uh, multi-tenant uh, cloud native uh, data system. So multi-layer architecture actually provide a very natural way to tier data between different storage layers. It also provides a, a very great IO isolation model between different IO passes. So in, in Pulsar, there, there are three tiers. Brokers is the first tier. It's used for caching the real-time hot data. They are mainly used for serving low latency writes in real time reads. And bookies is the second tier. It's used for storing warm data. It's mainly used for fast writes in small, uh, small scale batch reads. But obviously, you can, if you want to configure your bookkeeper cluster to run in a uh, very large scale, you are able to support large uh, uh, scale of batch reads. And one of the kind of the largest bookkeeper cluster is actually have, uh, I, I think between 1,000 and 2,000 uh, 2, nodes. And it's actually used uh, heavily in uh, large scale of uh, data processing. And tier storage is actually the third tier and it's used for storing the long-term data, long-term code data. It's mainly used for large volume scans. It naturally segregates different IO operation in different components and provides uh, really strong IO isolation. And as you can see here, like different type of workloads is actually access different IO components. And it, it's the key to a su very successful multi-tenant data system. And as all you can see uh, with uh, multi-layer cloud native architecture, Pulsar can naturally meet the requirements of being a cloud native data system. But also, Pulsar was designed from the first day, uh, it was designed to be geo replicate. And everything of geo replication is built in. You don't need to run external, uh, like, you know, maker like uh, replication job to replicate data between different geo -loc locations. The Pulsar team has learned a lot from operating traditional messaging systems in Kafka. Hence, Pulsar was designed to be a fully API-driven operational system with a very comprehensive administration API. 
Also, Pulsar is a very uh, extens extensible plug both system, providing a lot of security plugins to make it super secure and reliable. So all of these kind of make Pulsar uh, become a, a kind of a cloud native uh, real-time data system. According to our survey, uh, more than 50% of Pulsar deployments are on Kubernetes or cloud. To put everything together, now we have a very clear picture on why Pulsar is arising in the cloud native ecosystem. From, from bottom up, Pulsar was designed for cloud native operations. It's very easy to operate and can easily run on Kubernetes and integrate with a lot of cloud native storages like S3, Azure Blob Store, uh, GCS. And on top of this cloud native architecture, Pulsar builds uh, its unified batch in event stream storage using a segment century architecture. It uses Bookkeeper for fast low latency writes in cloud native tier storage for large volume scan in long term storage. By building the storage system around the uh, cloud uh, storage, it gains the infinity storage capability from the uh, from all the cloud provider and providing the capability to do both batch and stream processing. And on top of this unified batch in event stream storage, it offers a unified meshing model for support both queuing and streaming. And with the protocol handler framework, we build KLP, AOP, MK, uh, MOP, on top of the same uh, scalable distributed stream storage and to support popular uh, Matching protocols like uh, Kafka, MQP, MQTT to allow people to use their familiar tools to interact with Pulsar. Both mechanisms provide uh, enterprise or companies a converged matching solutions. But is this all for driving the, uh, the growth of Pulsar's adoption? The answer is always no. And Pulsar, uh, people choose Pulsar also for its completeness. So you are not just choose for a simple queuing system or a simple streaming system, but it's a very complete messaging and event streaming platform and it includes uh, PubSub messaging, uh, protocol handler to support uh, Kafka, uh, MQTT, MQP protocols, uh, has a connect built-in connector framework, be able to integrate with uh, third-party systems, and uh, have a tier storage, be able to integrate with cloud-native storages, and uh, also provide the capability to run uh, business logic in service functions, and also in, uh, integrate well with a lot of popular data processing engines like Spark, Flink, and Presto. Also. It's a high performance system. We recently published a blog post in benchmark report in response to an inaccurate benchmark report published by another messaging vendor. After we fixed the issue we found in their benchmark, it's clearly Pulsar is the fastest messaging solution. We have, see, uh, we have seen Pulsar have, has two to three times higher throughput comparing to Kafka. And uh, Pulsar also have a, a much more consistent low latency than Kafka. So the 99 percentile end-to-end -end latency stays around five to 10 milliseconds, regardless increasing the number of the uh, partitions. However, if you do the same operations in Kafka, you will see the latency of Kafka increased from milliseconds to 100 seconds. Please note here, it's 100 seconds, it's not milliseconds. So we see the performance degrade uh, very badly in Kafka when you increase the number of partitions to beyond thousands of uh, partitions. So we also publish our benchmark blog post in both English and Chinese. For the full detail, uh, you can check out the link in this slide and um, it would have all the details. and uh, my coworker Peng Hui is going to give a presentation about uh, benchmarking Pulsar versus Kafka on AWS this afternoon. 
and it will be present in Mandarin. But uh, if you are uh, interested in that topic, uh, you are welcome uh, and you are in encouraged to join that session. And uh, Pulsar also has a very comprehensive ecosystem. We have tons of built-in uh, connectors, protocol handlers to support uh, popular messaging uh, protocols like uh, Kafka, MQP, uh, MQTT, and integrate with modern processing engines like Flink, Spark, and integrate with different cloud storage systems to offload data from Bookkeeper to cloud storage. Not only Pulsar has uh, very strong communities, but also Pulsar has uh, inter enterprise grade support from Stream Native. At Stream Native, uh, we offer fully managed Pulsar service for, uh, with enterprise grade support for Pulsar. So we recently launched uh, our Pulsar as a service in Google Cloud platform through our cloud hosted offering, Stream Native Cloud. But today, uh, I would like to share and we. We are proud to uh, uh, announce that we, we are launching Streaming Cloud on Alibaba Cloud, uh, making postal service available for most of the Chinese uh, users. Uh, my coworker Yang Yang will give a presentation about uh, Stream Native Cloud later today. So our goal at Stream Native is to make postal available everywhere. And we will be launching Stream Native Cloud on AWS at the end of the, this year and looking for launching uh, the same service on Asia uh, in Q1 uh, 2021. Uh, please stay tuned if the cloud provider you're looking for is not uh, available at this moment. And if you have any questions about our cloud service, feel free to reach out to me at Slack channel or Twitter. And as the leading company in the, uh, uh, in the Pulsar community, we don't just focus on one cloud service, but we also help the whole Pulsar project in the community to improve. And there are a lot of important features uh, that are introduced, are uh, going to be introduced in Pulsar. And I'd like to share some of them and to give uh, and highlight about uh, the, the whole roadmap of Pulsar in, in the next six months to uh, 12 months. So first, uh, we are going to release uh, 27, uh, 27, uh, 270 release next uh, next week. And along this release, we are going to release Pulsar Transaction as a developer preview feature. Uh, but you are encouraged to test out this feature and give us